In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash began to reign, and he reigned forty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba, and Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days, because Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people continued to sacrifice and make offerings on the high places. Joash said to the priests, All the money of the holy things that is brought into the house of the Lord, the money for which each man is assessed, the money from the assessment of persons, and the money that a man's heart prompts him to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take each from his donor, and let them repair the house wherever any need of repairs is discovered. But by the twenty-third year of King Joash, the priests had made no repairs on the house. Therefore King Joash summoned Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them, Why are you not repairing the house? Now therefore take no more money from your donors, but hand it over for the repair of the house. So the priests agreed that they should take no more money from the people, and that they should not repair the house. Then Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it and set it beside the altar on the right side as one entered the house of the Lord. And the priests who guarded the threshold put in it all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. And whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, the king's secretary and the high priest came up and they bagged and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. Then they would give the money that was weighed out into the hands of the workmen who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they paid it out to the carpenters and the builders who worked on the house of the Lord, and to the masons and the stonecutters, as well as to buy timber and quarried stone for making repairs on the house of the Lord, and for any outlay for the repairs of the house. Second Kings 12, 1 through, thir- 1 through 12. Second Chronicles 24. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. And Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada got for him two wives, and he had sons and daughters. After Joash decided to restore the house of the Lord, and he gathered the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out to the cities of Judah and gather from all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year, and see that you act quickly. But the Levites did not act quickly. So the king summoned Jehoiada the chief and said to him, Why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and Jerusalem the tax levied by Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the congregation of Israel for the tent of testimony? For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God, and had also used all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord for the Baals. So the king commanded, and they made a chest, and set it outside the gate of the house of the Lord. And proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring in for the Lord the tax that Moses the servant of God laid on Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought their tax and dropped it in the chest until they had finished. And whenever the chest was brought to the king's officers by the Levites, when they saw that there was much money in it, the king's secretary and the officer of the chief priest would come and empty the chest and take it and return it to its place. Thus they did day after day and collected money and abundance. And the king and Jehoiada gave it to those who had charge of the work of the house of the Lord, and they hired masons and carpenters to restore the house of the Lord, and also workers in iron and bronze to repair the house of the Lord. So those who were engaged in the work labored, and the repairing went forward in their hands, and they restored the house of God to its proper condition and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, and with it were made utensils for the house of the Lord, both for the service and for the burnt offerings, and dishes for incense and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord regularly all the days of Jehoiada. So what is this story about and why am I talking about it? I was doing some thinking probably over the last maybe five or six years, I remember I was uh, tasked to record a banquet where Ted Cruz was speaking and uh, it was a pro-life organization. And I couldn't say this for sure about this pro-life organization, but I thought it interesting that none of the pro-life organizations in Texas, the nonprofits, the ones who were like lobbying and collecting donations and stuff to fight abortion and regulate it, none of them in their statements, had the goal to actually outlaw abortion. None of them were talking about it as murder. 
And so they all just wanted to regulate it. And that got me thinking, isn't that kind of like a dentist who gives children a sucker on the way out the door? Isn't that a conflict of interest? It's a conflict of interest for the dentist because it's job security. It's like, hey, come back and see me. You know, don't ever stop eating sugar or else you'll never have to come back here again. And I feel like that's a temptation for nonprofits or or other businesses in general where they're not actually interested in fixing the root problem. They want to stick around to help it forever. Uh, I know that the NRA engages in this in California. They actually sponsor gun control bills in California. have been doing that for decades. Because if there's nothing else to fight, then the NRA goes away and you don't need to be a donor anymore. You've got people collecting money. Second Kings 12. So they had been collecting money. It sounds like he told them this like right when he began to reign, which it's funny that only a kid would do this. The previous Kings didn't say anything, but this, this King, he was seven when he started to reign. So he's like, the temple's crumbling. <laughs> Nobody else has said anything, but the seven-year-old says it. So he tells him to do it. And then because he's only seven years old, they're like, oh, yes, king. Yes, king. And then they don't do anything. And then for 23 years. So now he's 30 and he knows better and he can come back to him and he says, why haven't you repaired anything? You've been collecting money all this time. Where where has that money been going? And it doesn't say that he asked them what they did with the money. It, and it also doesn't say that they ever gave an account for it. But they've been collecting money from people for 23 years and didn't touch the house. Where did that money go? It's just gone. And then in 2 Kings 12, verse 8, it says, and it says not only, so the priests agreed that they should take no more money from the people. Okay, good. If you're not going to do the repairs, stop taking money. But then it says that they also agreed that they should not repair the house. So they've collected all this money. They didn't save it. They weren't intending, ever intending on repairing the temple with it. So they were acting, acting deceptively. And so they're like, well, we still want to repair the temple. So guess what? We have to collect even more money. We got to collect the money again. And then they go and they collect it from all the, all the places that they're allowed to, or they were collecting it from the places that they were allowed to at first. And then he said, so stop collecting that money for the temple. So I don't know if they stopped collecting that money altogether. They probably didn't. They probably just stopped saying that they were going to use it for repairs in the temple. So they continued collecting that money, but then they started another collection on top of all that, that they had to make a chest for and put a hole in it and people would put money in it as they walked by. I look around and I see decay and disrepair in God's temple among his people and people continue to give money and I continue to see very little fruit produced. And so I'm like, hmm, where would I want that money to go if I gave it to them? Maybe I should give it directly and reduce some of that overhead. That increases accountability, but it also increases the amount of testimony that I can give with my giving. I'm not giving it to somebody else and then they figure out what to do with it. It's I need to be able to figure out what I can do around me or somebody that I know personally. I want to ask them and I want to see what has been done. Where did that go? What did that do? Who did that help? Otherwise you given for 23 years like these people were and you get no benefit from it. The text doesn't even attempt to answer where that money went. Isn't that funny? Well, this serves as a warning for us. Two of the purposes of the tithe, one of them was you're supposed to take 10% of all of the increase of your ground. The tithe, is, the tithe actually never refers to money except for one time when Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek of all the spoils of war. Outside of that single instance, the tithe never involves money. The tithe is always only increase of the ground, so plants and animals. Nothing else needs to be tithed on. And well, why is that? Why isn't it money? Well, because the tithe, you were supposed to take it every year and go and feast before the Lord and enjoy the tenth of your produce, celebrate with it. 
you were allowed to sell your tithe if it was too much to take with you all the way to the city, all the way to Jerusalem. You sell your tithe and then you take it, bind it as money so it's transportable. And then you get there and then you turn it back into goods and you're allowed to buy wine, strong drink, food, like anything that you want because this is a celebration. And then every third year, that tithe was specifically supposed to go to uh, enabling the Levite and the priest and the sojourner to come and dine with you. So the tithe was in celebration in a feast. It's not money. And so I see people giving to churches without asking, where, where does this money go? Is this just paying for a building and a nice piano? Or is this actually going to evangelism, eating with poor people, bringing them into the fold, inviting them, being hospitable to them, welcoming them, encouraging emigration into the body, encouraging converts, personal relationships. And when I started to think that way, it made me realize, hmm, I need to take personal responsibility for my tithe. 